Well, I think that it's a story about today. It's a parable that takes place in the 30s, but it is very much about a specific moment in time that I feel a great connection with. And like any great classic piece, it says different things to different generations. So it said something very specific in the 60s. Revivals of it in the 80s said something completely different. I worked on a production 10 years ago which spoke very much to the moment it was created in and I think this one will feel, if I've done my job correctly, very contemporary. Yeah, I think it's timeless. I think it's a timeless piece of theater and I think there's always something to be said for the perils of ignoring the evil growing around you and I think that this show does that really beautifully and it allows us to kind of take a window into what's distracting us from the gravity of the political situation that's forming slowly around us, which I think is always going to be relevant, always going to be true. Um, what's sad for me is that you'd like to think that this is a historical play, but it's not. And every time you finish telling it, you're like, okay, good, so we told it, and we don't, we've learned from it, we can move on in life. And unfortunately, we keep coming back to this piece. The original production had a mirror on stage in the set and the movie did that as well and Alan and Wilson have put that into our production and I think that that's incredibly relevant. It's a, it's classic because it holds a mirror up to the people who are watching it and saying it looks like it's pretend but it's actually you. And, and the mirror is a big was a signal thing for me because I wanted to explore the idea of complicity, which is much more complicated than we think. And the question of if we're not against something that is going on around us, are we for it? And there's no black and white answer, there's no easy answer. But this, uh, this play is the question mark and an exploration of that. Um, I encountered this piece when I was a little too young to encounter this piece. I had to sing Vilka Men in some children's community theater like review oh, of the hits. <laughs> and I was like, what a catchy tune. And so I watched the movie and I was like nine years old. It was not a movie for nine year olds. So it, it's been in my life for a very long time. And the first time I worked on it was at Northwestern University where we both went. And I directed it there. I've choreographed it twice since and directed it one more time since. So I've encountered it a couple of times. It's my favorite piece of theater. So whenever I get an opportunity to work on it, I jump. I've, I've had many uh, encounters with the piece. My first memory of it is that my mother had the original score. So when I was teaching myself to play piano as a 10 year old, I loved playing some of the chords in the music. And then I encountered the movie and then we all have the signal shows from our uh, childhood and young adulthood. And the Broadway revival of this happened when I was 13 or 14. So I remember seeing it in New York as a teenager, and it was such a shocking revival, and it changed the meaning of the piece so much. So it was a really important thing in my development as a, a young theater person. And then, oddly enough, it is the show that brought me to Washington. Um, when I was a senior at Northwestern, before Katie's time. I directed my first play um, and I thought I would be a director. And I met Molly Smith, the artistic director of Arena, on spring break. Unbeknownst to me, she was going to do cabaret in the fall of 2006. And in her office on that spring break, she asked me if I would be her assistant director. And so I got the job. And Molly is such a politically engaged director and she had a really visceral take on it. And it was just another reminder of what a classic can be, and that a classic is something that is really malleable and can be reinterpreted every 10 years to, to really be about something else. So I learned a lot about the piece on that production, but also from Molly, a great lesson in uh, what a director can bring to a piece. As someone much, much older than these two young whippersnappers, <laughs> Uh, I've done the show a couple times, and I've, I actually have done it before the rights to some of these songs were available. So I've done like all the old versions, like I've done Sitting Pretty, I've done Why Should I Wake Up, and I even did Telephone Song um, way back. Uh, and but and I was older when I saw the Broadway revival, um, but it just hit me like a ton of bricks. I went in just for, uh, just like, oh, yeah, let's go see Capri. I had done it a couple times and never had the impact. 
And then when I actually saw it, it just kind of blew me away and it's lived with me ever since. So it's been nice to be able to take a look. Now having seen what the show can become, uh, especially as history has marched since the 40s, um, and it's been great to explore that. And and, uh, and I would say it's fun to explore, but it's not really fun to explore it. It's more just um, edifying to see what art can do. And that was uh, a big thing, seeing what commercial theater can do for art, uh, for me, back when I saw it. The biggest uh, thing that opened my eyes about the piece was that as I began to research what uh, clubs were like in the 20s in Berlin, they were much different than what I had seen in the revival, which was a lot of women in slips and uh, uh, really dingy. There were opulent clubs, there were dance halls where uh, the orchestra was on stage, and cabaret meant a lot of times a variety show with jugglers, ventriloquists, uh, all different kinds of costumes. And so I felt that for me, one exciting avenue was to see how much we could reinvent the numbers in the club itself. And the idea that each different song could have a very different flavor and that they could be evocative and they could be funny and they could have all different kinds of tones. So I wanted to juxtapose uh, the lushness of the world of the cabaret with the dinginess of the dark reality that was happening in 1930. I think the, the most challenging thing for me, which is always the most challenging part about this piece, is to find the joy inside of it, because it is it does go downhill so quickly and everything gets so bleak so fast, but that really only has weight if we've countered it with joy. So finding those moments in the numbers where it can be hilarious and you can get people to laugh and to applaud and to be having a good time so that when it hits a wall, it feels that much more significant. So sometimes it's easy to get kind of dragged down in how horrible the backdrop is and what was going on at the time and some of the atrocities that were just starting to take place and to kind of be like, okay, well, we're going to do a dance number here, and how do we make that joyful, and how do we not carry that weight on our shoulders so that when we do need to see that, that it means that much more. And I think the other great challenge that goes with that, and it's a challenge for me and it's a challenge for the cast, is that hindsight is twenty twenty, but uh, no one in that world could have predicted what would have happened. Right. Or else many people would have just mm -hmm. left. And so what we judge as their behavior now uh, we have to take a step back and, and understand, um, especially for the Herr Schultz character, that he felt that he was a German and nothing could happen to him. Right. And so that's the tragedy of it, is working through that and not getting ahead of it. And it's also technically uh, the biggest challenge. Yeah. yeah, I have to say both of you have done like really great job in terms of like, we're not playing the end. That's yeah. like, especially mm -hmm. with the Herr Schultz story, but through the whole thing, because it's, 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 new and you have no idea how you would react in that situation and it's fascinating to see the take of Herr Schultz and just like oh it'll pass and you just yeah. hope it'll pass and you know but then you can just open any book and you know that yeah it doesn't mm -hmm. and I think that the interesting thing of a play where you know what the ending is is to not make it black and white and uh, to figure out how although it seems inevitable it might not have been so inevitable. And to watch how people change their minds, how people delude themselves, why they go to the cabaret, why they think it might be okay, and to let that reality live as much as possible. Right. That's the, the inter interesting thing is to see how they get to the finish line because we know what the finish line is. And how many people just do nothing and how that ultimately makes them complicit in something that they had no idea they were complicit in. And that's really heartbreaking. Yeah, and the other challenge I would say is that it's, uh, it's so has such a clear contemporary echo um, that I don't, as a director, want to be so obvious about all the choices in the production or hit, hammer the audience on the head. And so there has to be a degree of subtlety and carefulness uh, in how we construct it. Right. And you don't want to be prescriptive. Yeah. Yeah. Come taste the wine. <laughs> come hear the band. Well, something, <laughs> come blow your horn. Let's start celebrating right this way. Your table's Your waiting. table's <laughs> waiting. Damn, was, what's the next word? Life is a cabaret, old chum. So if you have time, 
come to the cavern. Sold it. Nailed Fire. it. Fire. <laughs> <laughs> That's the kind of director I am. <laughs> <laughs>